Hello and welcome to today's episode of Rainer on Leadership. We have really a really interesting topic today. If you have checked out the title, you know we're talking about the great de-churching. And no, I have not stolen that from Michael and Jim. They actually are on the show to talk about their book, which has just really taken off. And it's a subject that I think most everyone's interested in. Um, I hope they're not tired of talking about it at this point, because they just told me that this is interview number 128. Or is that what you said, Michael? Yeah. Interview number 128 um, on this topic. Um, so I'm glad that we were a priority for you guys when it came to uh, t talking about your book. I uh, want to welcome Michael Graham we and Jim Davis to, to the show. <laughs> uh want to welcome uh, Jim Davis and Michael Graham to the show. Jim Davis is the teaching pastor at Orlando Grace Church. Michael Graham is the program director for the Keller Center for Cultural Apologetics. Um, they've written this great book called The Great Dechurching. And if you're watching on YouTube, there's the, there's the book. We'll, we'll put a link in the show notes as well. Um, make sure that you go get it if you have not already. Um, so, Michael, Jim, uh, welcome to Rainer on Leadership. Glad to be Thanks here. Thank you for having us. us. Glad to be here. Well, I want to jump right into this um, because I, I think everyone's feeling it. I think the reason your book's so popular right now is because everyone's feeling it. The, this, if you're a pastor, you understand that people are leaving. So what do we do about this? And what's really going on? That's the whole theme of your book. So I, I would love for, for um, you guys just to say, okay, in what ways were your findings um, – consistent with some of the prevailing narratives that everyone kind of feels surrounding people leaving the church? And in what ways is your research telling a different story? Yeah, that's a great question. It's probably one of the most important questions that we could ask. Um, so I think the, in terms of prevailing narratives, some of the, it depends on whether your kind of media slash information diet leaned a little bit to the left, or if your media information diet leaned a little bit to the right. I'll cover both of those, and then I'll kind of kind of cover the main story that we're trying to tell in The Great Dechurching. So if your media diet leaned a little bit to the left, the story that was being told about why people had been leaving um, churches and houses of worship across the country was largely because of a story of those churches making major mistakes on their own part, whether institutionally, individually, or both. So things like racism, misogyny, political syncretism, um, clergy scandal, uh, sexual abuse, these kinds of things. Now, if, you're, if your information slash media diet leaned a little bit to the right, the prevailing story there was, well, people were leaving um, houses of worship across the country, largely because of secular progressivism, the culture, or things like the um, the sexual revolution. And so uh, both of those stories, they're not wrong. Um, the, you can find people, you know, who have left houses of worship and churches um, for those very reasons. However, when you zoom out, it wasn't the biggest story about why people have left churches. The biggest story is a really boring story. It's a story that isn't going to get people to, um, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, watch, tune in, listen, uh, or, or click headlines. Um, the story there was a story of people just kind of casually moving on because their habits and rhythms just changed, and they no longer prioritized the, you know, the regular gathering. Um, for uh, for church. And so the top four reasons for why people left um, church were, number one, they moved. Number two, attendance was inconvenient. Number three, um, they had uh, some kind of marriage, remarriage, divorce, or some other significant family change. And then number four, they had other priorities for their time and money. And so those four reasons we would all characterize as being casual reasons. So we call people who left for these types of type of reasons, the casually dechurched. The people who left with much more pain, um, particularly, you know, if you're kind of listening to that 
the, the kind of left-leaning information diet, those people who left with pain, those people we called de church casualties. So about three quarters of the people who left, so about 30 of the 40 million people who've left houses of worship left casually. And about 10 million people um, are in that second category of, of de church casualties. So the story that we're telling is not that um, the, you know, kind of, you know, left-leaning narrative or the right-leaning narrative are totally false. They're not. They're just incomplete. And the the lion's share of people are leaving for much more boring reasons, you know, pedestrian, commonplace, you know, <laughs> you know, kind of reasons that really just boil down to just rhythms and habits. You know, of the 40 million people who left, 15 million of those people left evangelical churches, and uh, over half those people are willing to return um, uh, to evangelical churches today. So in the middle of, you know, a lot of bad news, and this is the largest and fastest religious shift in our country's history, both in terms of size and in terms of rate. You know, it's larger than the first first Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, and Billy Graham Crusades combined. And it's 25% faster than any other religious shift that we've had in our country's history. And all of those other religious shifts were towards the positive. This is the first to the negative. So um, that's kind of the ways in which we're kind of telling a little, a little bit of a different story than um, from the research than some of the prevailing narratives. You know, that's just such fascinating information. And I love how you have broken down the difference between de-churched casualty and the casually de church. And I want to unpack that a little more, but before we do, I certainly want to thank our sponsor, Tyndale, who has given us a story that's not boring. You just mentioned that there's uh, perhaps some boring reasons why people leave the church. Well, you know, one thing that's not boring, segue there, is the one-year Bible. I love the New Living Translation. I love what Tyndale has done uh, with many of their study Bibles, chronological Bibles, and uh, obviously this one-year Bible. Uh, the one-year Bibles are designed to help readers engage with the entire Bible in 365 days. I've used these Bibles before, um, and I absolutely love them. It, it's the discipline of reading Scripture every day. So this is a great resource to help pastors encourage their community to be in the Word every day. Day. They have several choices uh, for you to, to uh, pick from. There are men's and women's devotional editions. Um, they have a one-year chronological study Bible, which is something that I really like. It'd be great for Sunday school classes, small groups. You could even do a full church study, which we've done at West Bradenton, my church. Um, so you can check out all these options at theoneyearbible.com. Again, theoneyearbible.com. Uh, Tyndale is a sponsor of the show. We're very grateful for them, and uh, they've just got they've got the best Bibles. So go to the one year Bible dot com and uh, check out your options there. Okay, Jim, I want to jump into this. Um, you know, both of you have been, have have written this book, um, and I'd love for you to just comment on anything that Michael said, but also. You know, how did two pastors come to conduct what really is the most comprehensive study on de-churching to date? Like, tell me that story a little bit. Yeah, it really just started as cultural exegesis by two pastors. We live in Orlando. We were just down the street from you, I think. And, uh, and we wanted to minister well to our community. And in 2018, we saw a Barna study that, that identified the, what they called the Orlando met metropolitan area. And it said that we had the same percentage of evangelicals as New York City and Seattle, which was it hit us really interestingly for a lot of reasons. The, the main one, we feel very different than New York City and Seattle. And if you know anything about Orlando's history, I mean, whatever stream you find yourself in, in the 90s, something was going right for you. Campus Crusade moved here. RTS moved here. Ligonier, Wycliffe, you know, some really influential churches even benny hen was down the street doing his thing and it's just like so something was happening in every stream those and are very different groups jim now we have the same <laughs> very different groups we had the second largest mainline church in the nation and the southern baptist convention president in town so i mean it's like pick your stream and you're going to find something encouraging and now here we are equal to new york city and seattle and the study also said that 42% of the Orlando metropolitan area used to go to church and no longer does. And that made a lot of sense to us. The, the majority of the people who we interact with 
who don't go to church used to go to church. And so they're carrying with them biblical uh, values. In some cases, they really do seem to be Christians. And so that makes sense, you know, how, why we would feel different than New York City and Seattle, where they, uh, they're largely unchurched with none of these values, and they don't know a lot of the, the basic concepts of the faith. So we wanted to learn more. But we couldn't find any data. We, uh, my wife was taking an apologetics class at RTS at the time, and she wanted to do a research paper on dechurching. And the professor, it was Justin Holcomb, he said, that's a great idea. There's no research, though. There's nothing, you can't write a research paper if there's nothing to research. And so that set us down this path. Uh, we have a friend named Skylar Flowers who got us in touch with uh, Ryan Burge, who is a true social scientist, and he's a Christian. And Ryan Burge led, along with Paul Jupe, uh, you know, what, we ended up commissioning them to do the most comprehensive nationwide academically peer-reviewed study on de-churching in America. Um, and it was connected with our podcast at the time. We didn't know it was going to become a book, but we had a hunch that we are in the largest and fastest religious shift in the history of our country. And we, the study proved it. Now, one of the reasons that books like this don't get written is because we had to raise $100,000 for the research before we even knew what it would say. And so books like this don't make money, but thankfully there are Christians that came alongside to make this research happen. And then we did two more successive studies to understand where people are going, why they're leaving. And we did this, this specific deep dive into evangelicalism. But in short, just like Mike said, 40 million people leaving largely in the past 25 to 30 years uh, in terms of number, larger than the Great Awakenings and the Billy Graham Crusade, Crusade combined in terms of percentage, it's 25% larger than our previous largest religious shift, which was the 25 years post-Civil War. Um, it's also really interesting, I think, to see, to see how it started in the 1990s. Um, there were some real inflection points that began there as we saw de-churching begin on the secular left and then now uh, continuing on the secular right. You know, that's that's just a, a fascinating uh, take on all of this, um, and you're right about the research. You know, we, you know, at Church Answers, we have a lot of people asking us, well, j can you do a study on, and then name your topic? And what a lot of people don't realize is some of these research questions are six-figure endeavors in order to do them properly. Yeah. And research is right. very, very expensive. Um, I'm, I'm glad you guys spent all that money uh, because you, you made a pretty good book out of it. Um, again, the book is The Great De-Churching. You've probably heard of it, but in case you haven't, everyone's reading it. You need to be reading it. It's by Jim Davis and Michael Graham. Um, Michael, back to you. Um, give us just a, like a high-level snapshot of what's going on among these 15 million adult Americans who left evangelical churches. Um, I consider myself an ev evangelical, whatever that means. I know that term kind of has some different, you know, perspectives, but I consider myself a conservative evangelical. Most of our listeners know that. I don't like it when people leave my church, even though they do. What's going on? There's 15 million of them. What's going on, Michael? Yeah. So, you know, that's um, almost one in 20 uh, adult Americans have left an evangelical church. Um, so the, the 15 million people, there's, there's four different profiles that kind of came out of um, the uh, machine learning algorithm that Ryan used to sort our data. And so that's just a fancy term that means um, e the people in each of these four profiles have very, very, very similar answer choices on things like demographics, beliefs, doctrinal beliefs, um, when they left, why they left, their willingness to return, and why they would be willing to return. And so the four profiles boiled down to um, a group of 8 million people that we called cultural Christians. These are people who don't really have a basic understanding of the faith, don't look like they were really probably ever Christians. They're about 40 years old, and uh, but half of them are willing to return. And they left for very casual reasons, by and large. The second, third, and fourth profiles um, and we, we go in tremendous detail into each of these profiles, um, and, and as well as have a profile for mainline and Roman Catholic in the book, The Great Churching. But um, the second, third, and fourth profiles are about between two and two and a half, two and a half million people each. The second um, group are what we call mainstream evangelicals. So this group of de mainstream evangelicals, they also had the same average age of 40, but um, 
unlike the first group who left a decade ago, this group left around the time of COVID. And so, and they look very much like they're still Christians. Um, they have a deep love and affection uh, for Jesus, and they actually want to be back in church. And they've had very casual reasons for, you know, why they left. And so the the third group we called ex-evangelicals, um, oh, 100% of the mainstream evangelical uh, people who left are willing to return to an evangelical church right now. The third group, 0% are willing to return to an evangelical group. And that's why we called them the ex-evangelicals. Now, contrary to how that, that term is used kind of in the, typically the online discourse on these things, most of these people have not, um, certainly not, most of them have not deconverted. And um, many of them have not abandoned kind of core doctrines in the faith. Most of them, probably about four and five, um, have undergone a significant crisis of faith when it comes to either bad experiences on the individual or the institutional level with an evangelical church. And they've probably done some significant work in uh, determining the difference between the Jesus of the Bible and the Jesus of, say, subculture, evangelical subculture. So there would be difference, you know, yeah, some example of, you know, evangelical subculture would be, you know, like the church that I grew up in um, before I was a Christian. And this was, you know, in, you know, in a large, you know, a large evangelical tradition. Um, they almost never talked about what Jesus did on the cross, but they talked a lot about um, humans and dinosaurs living together and how the end times, um, you know, big, you know, 30 or 40 pages of, you know, uh, <laughs> posters on how the end times kind of sorted themselves out. So it looks like um, these people had some pretty negative experiences. And um, what's interesting is, is this group is not super online and um, they're predominantly female and middle-aged, so um, 53, average age, and they left not too long after 9-11. Um, but what's interesting about that group is 79% um, of them are willing to go to another, um, another type of uh, Christian church, just, you know, not, not in the evangelical tradition. So there's, uh, and the Holy Spirit definitely seems to be working on most of, most of these folks. Um, and then the fourth profile is the, um, uh, is the BIPOC group, um, this group, uh, BIPOC stands for Black, Indigenous, and Persons of Color. Um, the BIPOC group um, is 0% white, the, um, as opposed to the first four profiles um, that were predominantly white, 98%, um, 91%, and 82%, respectively, for the you know groups one, two, and three before this. Um, uh, no white people in this group at all. Um, what's interesting is our machine learning algorithm did not have the ability to see ethnicity or race or sort based on it. So um, this sorting happened by accident. Um, and uh, Ryan says this is because, you know, race and ethnicity is a significant sociological category and it casts a long, a long shadow in terms of the way that people experience um, all sorts of things from America all the way down to church. So uh, over half this group are, um, this group was predominantly men, um, predominantly African-American men. Over half of this group was um, African-American men. And uh, interestingly enough, um, this group by far had the highest income and highest education of any group. So we're talking about over a million um, uh, six mid six figure uh, income African American men, and they left a little bit before the turn of the millennium, um, on average. But what's interesting is about two thirds of this group are willing to return to an evangelical church today, even though they haven't darkened the door in over twenty five years. Um, the uh, the ex evangelicals in the BIPOC group are kind of um, the the ex evangelicals left. They're almost they're pretty much all de church casualties. The BIPOC group is a mixture of casual and casualty. And the first two groups are largely um, casual with the cultural Christians and, and mainstream evangelicals. So that's kind of the, you know, kind of the, the gist of, you know, the various different profiles. The, the cultural Christians and the, and the BIPOC group, um, their orthodoxy scores were, were not terribly high. The um, ex-evangelicals um, seem to largely actually understand Nicene Creed level Christianity and the mainstream evangelicals. Um, scored even higher on their understanding of kind of the core tenets of our faith than people who still go to church. So 
I had a conversation with somebody last night. I don't want to give too many too many details here because uh, I don't have their permission to tell this story. But they were somebody who had left our church. We had an event last night um, with a, a block party. We'll just say a big block party um, for everyone in the neighborhood. And had a good time. Uh, somebody came up to me and was like, yeah, I, I left right after COVID and I need to come back. And so I asked him, I said, well, why'd you leave? Like, you know, I don't really have a good reason. I don't even know. <laughs> and I said, well, well, why don't you come back? And they said, you know what? I think I will. So here's the point for all of our listeners. And here's what your research has proven is there's a significant amount of people that have left the church who, if, if invited and if asked, are willing to come back, but probably won't unless you ask them. So your membership roles, a lot of churches have these membership roles. Your membership roles may be your greatest outreach tool. Get into your database, look at those names, put check marks by the ones where, you, okay, I know this person isn't here. Haven't seen this person forever. Last term, last time this person was attended three years ago and call them. Likely you are going to have some level of success even if you don't, you can at least rest easy that you were attempting to shepherd people who have left your church. Um, so very important thing to take note. Jim, I want to I want to give you this final question because you're a pastor. You're up there in Orlando, and yeah, you're right down the road from me. Um, we'll have to come visit each other sometime or something, uh, take you out to lunch. What surprised you as a pastor? She did all this research. What surprised you? Gosh, there's a lot here. There's a, there are a lot of things. So uh, directly from the research and all of this has implications in pastoral m ministry. Um, what One thing that really interested me is how the type of person de-churching has evolved over time. In the 90s, it was largely on the secular and political left. Um, the fall of the Soviet Union had to do a lot with that, the rise of the internet, the rise of the political right, and 9-11. So that we, do a, we, we flesh that out more in the book. But... A lot of those things became an opportunity for people who pretty much already knew they weren't Christians to just be okay saying that. So, you know, before the fall of so Soviet Union, if you said, uh, you know, I'm, if you heard somebody say, I'm no longer a Christian, it wasn't uncommon for the next question to be, well, are you a communist? I, I can remember that. And it's, But now there's a freedom to be a an American and not a Christian. You can find community on the Internet. People uh, saw 9-11 and said, well, you know, if that's what religious fundamentalism does, I'm out. So it feels like in the 90s, it was more people looking for an excuse. And that's not everyone, but largely. But as the last 25 years have progressed, you have the de-churching is on the secular right is happening at twice the pace of the secular left, almost catching up to the total numbers of people de-churching. The other, another thing with that that's interesting, you have these sociological categories of belief, belong, and behave. And you normally, according to the social scientists, uh, behavior is the first thing to, cho to, to change, then belonging, and lastly, belief. So we can see the longer someone has been de-churched, the lower their orthodoxy scores are. Um, we also saw that it was fascinating uh, to see the inverse relationship between education and de-churching. So only 3% of evangelicals with graduate degrees have de-churched. So this really goes after the boogeyman of higher secular education, taking our children away. Um, Ryan Burge has done a lot more research on this. Anybody who isn't subscribed to his Substack, I strongly suggest it. But the way that we look at education, uh, both inside and outside the church has changed. Uh, it's, you know, what Mike was talking about, and you were talking about how many evangelicals are willing to return today. You know, de-churched people are not monolithic, but if I can identify a de-churched mainstream evangelical, and I, I can do so in about four questions in a very normal conversation, in my own personal ministry, every time that I have invited them to church, 100% of the time they've come. <laughs> and, so, and so it's just been, it's the, the, the low-hanging fruit in that specific area has been... Uh, it has been a real, really surprise to me because Mike talks about often we used to think of inviting someone to church as a relationship killer, but it may actually be a real relationship developer. Um, the generational opportunity before us, I think that settled in over the course of this, this thing, this study, because we're not looking to just get people in seats or pews or money in the you know coffers or whatever the modern day equivalent is the uh, you know, the in the you know, online giving. 
we statistically speaking, the children of the de church will be unchurched. And so we have a generational opportunity to invest in the de church that will pay dividends for hundreds of years. So we it's changed a lot of what we do in the church and I, we can you know talk about that in a future episode but um that surprised me and then probably the last thing is just really how poor the mental health needs are you know how significant the mental health needs are in the de-church community and a direct correlation between leaving the body and uh your own mental health so there are other things but in you know th- those are some of the top things that come to my mind well, you mentioned another episode. Why don't we do that? We're up against the time. So I think we should come back for part two because I find this fascinating. Again, we've got Michael Graham and Jim Davis with us. The book is The Great Dechurching. Great book. Link in the show notes. Uh, we'll put a link to Ryan Burge's uh, Substack as well. I'm a subscriber. Uh, I love his research. Solid guy. You should be following him. Uh, so we'll give him a little a little plug as well because, you know, his name's on the cover too. So I uh, want to give him a little love there. And we also want to thank our sponsor, California Baptist University, an incredible school with a great mission, top-notch faculty, beautiful campus. This is the school to go to. And if you are a high schooler or if you know high schoolers or if you have high schoolers in your house or in your church, you should be listening because eligible high schoolers can earn college credit online and CBU is offering the first class for free. Just got to buy books and course materials. That's it. And, you know, after that, you get a significant discount, $166 per credit hour versus $613 per credit hour for each subsequent class. This is an opportunity for your high schoolers to get college credit. You don't want to do it at any other place other than CBU. Um, So I would encourage you to go to calbaptist.edu slash PCC. Again, calbaptist.edu slash PCC. We'll put a link in the show notes to that. Certainly want to thank California Baptist for sponsoring the show. Want to thank again, Jim Davison, Michael Graham for being on the show with us, uh, talking about the great de-churching. We've got more to discuss in the next episode, so we'll do part two then. We'll see you guys in a week. <laughs>